Straza with the Heritage School of Woodworking. And in this video, I'm going to talk about some of the different hand planes. I'm going to narrow it down to the hand planes that I use in my everyday woodworking, as well as how to uh, adjust the plane to get the most accurate shaving. We're going to talk about the different parts of the planes and uh, some of these different sizes and what the planes are used for. You can see there's a whole array of planes here, and these are typically called bench planes. The reason for that is they're used on the bench. They're used for flattening your material. Uh, there's a lot of different planes, specialty planes, such as molding planes, uh, that are used for shaping the, the edge of a board. This is a typical molding plane here. You can see there's a profile that's actually cut into the plane. This is a wooden molding plane. And again, there's, you can have hundreds of these for different profiles, a little bit different than what we have here, and that is bench planes. You'll notice I've got different sizes here, ranging from small all the way up to a large one here. I've thrown in a few different configurations here. We've got a, a low angle plane here and here. These are low angle planes, and you'll notice that every single one of these planes are pretty much configured the same way. We've got the iron right here, which in most of these planes is bedded at 45 degrees. The iron is angled like this. These are referred to as high angle planes or bevel down planes. So why the different sizes? Well, Stanley uh, was the one who came up with the different sizes, and some of these are Stanleys, and some are uh, some current planes that are being made nowadays. But you'll see Stanley came up with some different sizes. They started actually with a number one and went all the way through to a number eight. I don't have all the sizes here, but I've got a number two. Uh, let's see, I actually have a number three. And then there was a number four, which was sat right in the middle. I've got two number four and a halves. Here's a number five. This is that low angle plane, trying to confuse you. Uh, Stanley actually did a five and a half. They did a number six and a number seven, which was a little longer, and then a number eight. So they came, did a number one all the way up through number eight. The number really just denoted just the size in the length and the width as well. So all of the Stanley planes are pretty much configured in the same way. They all have pretty much the same parts. There's some slight variations to them. Now why the, the reason for the different sizes? Well, the small planes are, make nice collector's items. Uh, they actually work well. This is actually my son's plane. It fits well in his small hands and he can plane well. Um, the number four and four and a half are generally used as a smoothing plane. The number five plane was referred to as a jack plane or a four plane. A jack plane, it got its name because it was used as a jack of all planes. It could be used for both smoothing, it could be used for a little bit of jointing because it's a little longer. The number six, again, can be used as a, a four plane, used before some of the other planes. Also, its length enables you to joint with it. And the longer the plane, a number seven and a number eight, are purely jointer planes, and they're used for flattening the stock. Because of the length of the plane, the length of the plane enables you to be able to ride over any low spots in the wood and bringing all the high spots down and making it flat. Whereas a shorter plane is going to ride in and out of the inconsistencies in the material. Most of the wood nowadays that we prepare is prepared using machines, using a jointer and a planer. So a lot of these planes have fallen in disuse. So normally where we would have used a four plane and a scrub plane to scrub the material down and bring it down to size, uh, most of that is done with a machine. So we can narrow our use of planes. However, there are a few planes that I find to be absolutely essential. The plane that I use actually most often is a four and a half. I've got a, a Stanley four and a half right here and a modern make, maker's plane which is called a Lee Nilsson, 
which I find to be one of the best made planes uh, nowadays. If you're in the market for a plane, I highly recommend the Lee Nielsen plane. I often use a block plane as well, a low angle block plane, and a low angle jack plane. I find this, these three planes to be almost essential in your tool kit. If you want to add to this kit right here, you can get a jointer plane. I use a jointer plane for edge jointing, but we'll cover more of that in future videos. I'm going to put a lot of these planes out of the way and talk more specifically about the Stanley style uh, plane, which as I mentioned earlier, are all configured in the same way. So we'll put all of these out of the way and we'll focus just on this four and a half. I like the heft, the size of the four and a half. It works well for smoothing our material. Again, we pretty much surface all of our material, uh, bring it down, that is, to size using machines, but the final surfacing and the final shaping can be done with a smoothing plane. Now, when I talk about this plane and I mention the parts, these same parts uh, are applicable to any of the Bailey uh, Stanley uh, style planes. I mentioned Bailey, but uh, Stanley, Bailey, pretty much the same. So here's a Lee Nielsen number eight. The same parts are in this number four and a half or in this Stanley four and a half. What we have here is we've got the rear handle or the rear tote. We've got the front tote. We've got the cap iron which holds the whole blade assembly in place. There's two parts to the blade assembly. You've got the iron and you've got the um, chip breaker. The chip breaker sits on top of the iron. This part is the frog. That's what the blade assembly sits on. We've got the lateral adjustment which adjusts the blade side to side. We also have a depth adjustment right here which adjusts the blade forwards and backwards. That's what gives us our depth. Now, on the Lee Nielsen planes, the chip breaker almost looks like the blade. You've got a bevel on this side and a bevel on this side. Some people can confuse the chip breaker with the blade, putting it in backwards. The main difference here is, of course, the blade is sharp, but it's also longer. This part, the chip breaker, is actually removable by loosening this screw and sliding this back, sliding this to the side like this, and taking this off. As I mentioned earlier, the blade is beveled down. There's the bevel right there. And if you watch our video on sharpening a hand plane, you can actually see the different configurations for how to sharpen a plane. With this smoothing plane, I tend to put a slight camber in the iron, and I often take the corners off as well uh, so that the corners don't dig into the material when you're planing. Uh, we can test this to see how sharp this is. I like to just test it on my thumbnail. And if it grabs my thumbnail, holding it flat like this, then I know it's sharp. And I've sharpened this up and it's razor sharp, ready to go. So here's the iron bevel down like this. The chip breaker goes on like this. And you'll see the chip breaker. It has a little curve right in here and then the bevel like this. So the chip breaker goes on like this lid on just like this, bring it around, and you want to bring it up as close as you can. I like to bring it less than a sixteenth of an inch from the edge. What the chip breaker does is, again, bevel down here. When you're planing along, the chip will actually hit this bevel right here, and it'll pull it back, and as the name implies, it breaks the chip. Let's bring this up and I'm going to tighten this up as just like that and we'll put the whole iron assembly back into the plane just like this. Now when I put this in, I want to make sure that it's sitting flat against the frog. You can see right here that there's a gap right there and I've got to wiggle it around, even take the lateral adjustment, which is right here, this is the lateral adjustment, the depth adjustment. You'll notice when I turn this, it moves this part back and forth. That's our depth adjustment. So when I put this blade assembly in place here, 
We can move it, move it back and forth like this, wiggle this, and you can now see that it sits flat against the frog. That's very important. Let's put the cap iron back on here like this. Now, don't tighten this down too tight. You want to just make this somewhat snug, but, well, even maybe a little loose. Where you get your tightening action from is when you take the lever here and you lower it down. It actually puts pressure, as you can see, it's going to put pressure against that screw and make it tight. Now it's locked in place. The frog can be slid forwards and backwards to adjust the mouth opening. Personally, I don't really mess with it too much on the, the uh, four and a half plane. However, I do adjust the frog opening, which is more easily adjusted on the low angle plane. I adjust that frequently. And I use that mostly for figured woods and end grain. That is set up a little bit differently and we'll cover how that's set up in future videos. Now let's go on to adjusting the plane. There's two adjustments for this plane, both the depth adjustment and the side-to-side -side adjustment. So we have what we call our lateral adjustment, which is right here, and our depth adjustment. Both of those have to be fine-tuned. Now, when I set my lateral adjustment, that means I want the blade to be cutting equally on either side. I never want to have the blade cutting deeper on one side. Never. This is adjusted only to get it perfect to where it's cutting equally on both sides. However, the depth adjustment can be adjusted and will be adjusted depending on how much material I'm trying to remove. If I'm trying to remove a lot of material, I'm going to set the blade deeper. If I'm just trying to smooth, just take very fine shavings off, I'm going to back the blade off to where it's taking a little bit off. So let's start with the lateral adjustment. I can take a piece of scrap wood here, a piece of pine, putting it in the vise like this. The first thing I'm going to do is adjust the lateral adjustment. Sometimes I can adjust both the depth adjustment and the lateral adjustment simultaneously. But I'm going to do that by testing it both on the pine and feeling it with my thumb. You want to get it to where you can feel the depth with your thumb without even having to running it over a piece of wood. I can feel it first, and I can tell you right now, it's not going to cut anything. But let's just try it. We're going to try this side, and we're going to try this side. Nothing's happening. So let's just advance the blade. We can even set the plane on the material and advance the blade. Now, if I have just a little bit of adjustment to do, I don't mind if this is locked down. If I've got a lot of adjustment to do, sometimes I'll release this and adjust it forward. Let's just kind of adjust it like this until the blade starts engaging. A little bit more. I'm adjusting it like this until that blade just catches. See? Just bring it forward just a little bit more until that blade... Oh, there it is. See, it's starting to cut. Now we've got it adjusted. So I've started with the blade back and then I've brought it forward until it starts cutting. What a lot of people tend to do is they set the blade too deep and then they try to plane and it won't cut. Number one though, you've got to make sure that the blade is razor sharp. And please refer to the video on sharpening a plane because we go over the entire process of sharpening a planar. Extremely important that the blade is sharp. So now that we've got some depth, let's feel it with our thumb. What I'm doing is I'm taking my thumb and I'm running it like this. If I ran it to the side, I'd slice my thumb, but we're running it across like this. And it seems to me that the lateral adjustment is pretty good, but let's test it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to plane on this side of the plane and then all the way over on this side of the plane. That's going to adjust the lateral adjustment. Now let's test it on the wood. So I'm going to start over here. You'll notice too when I'm doing the edge of the board that I, ha I don't put my hand on top of the, the front tote. What I'll do is I'll put my thumb right here and my finger right on the side. That helps guide the plane along. The other thing you'll notice too is when I hold the rear tote, I never put four fingers in the plane. This makes for a very uncomfortable grip 
and you will develop blisters very fast if you're planing very long. So you've got to make sure that three fingers are in the plane and one finger is out. I've even put my pinky out for a more relaxed grip, uh, especially if this tends to be a little bit smaller right in here. Okay, so I'm planing this side here. So I plane there and you can see and hear that we're barely taking anything off, very, very fine. Now let's plane over here. Ah, you can see this is much heavier over there. So the lateral adjustment needs to be adjusted because it's cutting more on one side than it is on the other. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take and just push the lateral adjustment slightly towards the side that more is coming off on. Again, let's feel with our thumb because what I want is I wanna train my thumb to be able to feel the depth of cut and the lateral adjustment. So I wanna be able to feel what that shaving both looks like, sounds like, and actually is. So now we're gonna cut on this side. Ah, the shaving is very nice, very paper thin there, and over on this side. So now the lateral adjustment, it's a little bit more, and we're just barely touching it. Ah, that's nice there, and ah, that's perfect there. Look at that, both of which are exactly the same thickness, and you can tell by how translucent the actual shaving is. Now, I like the depth adjustment. That application is actually, that depth is actually not something that you'll use on all applications. You may find that that depth is great for just smoothing up your material, but say you need to take off a heavier shaving. Well, all you've got to do is advance the blade. Now you can hear it's taking off more of a shaving just by the sound. Hear that sound? If you want to take off more, there's even a heavier shaving. But I find for most work with this plane, it's best that you take off a very fine shaving. I'm gonna back it off now. Let's go back to our, our setting. There we have it. Very, very fine. We can advance it forward just a little bit. Maybe a little bit more. Ah, that's nice. Now once we've gone through the trouble of setting the lateral adjustment and the depth, the last thing I wanna do is throw this plane on its side on the bench. This is something that I find a lot of people do. They tend to put the plane on the bench, and this is something that was learned in, I believe, in public schools when they were trying to teach children how to respect the tools, not to throw a sharp tool on top of another tool. The problem is, is if you set it on the side like this, it both can adjust the lateral adjustment, throw it out of adjustment, and it also exposes the blade right here. If you are planing wood and you set the plane on a clean bench like this, there's no trouble with this whatsoever. The blade is protected, the lateral adjustment is protected, and it makes for easy access when you need to pick it up and go back to your work. I wanna show you what I do when I'm smoothing the surface of this board. Of course, you can't feel this in the video, but this has a little bit of a rough texture because it just came out of the planer and uh, planer knives are maybe a little dull. Sometimes you'll get ripples from the planer. So I'm gonna smooth this up. So we'll do that in the tail vise. One thing to keep in mind when you're planing is grain direction. As I've mentioned in some of the other videos, wood is like a series of straws. Here they are. And the grain, we can follow the grain like this. Now watch this grain line. It comes and it comes and it comes off the edge of the board like this. So imagine these series of straws like this. If I plane in this direction, we'll be fine. If I take and I plane in this direction, what happens? All of these straws are going to break like this. So I've got a plane in the direction of the grain. You can refer to it and even in the sense of uh, petting the hair, the hair on, the, the, on your, your pet. You pet it with the grain, right? You plane in the direction of the grain. Sometimes it's difficult to tell which way the grain is going as when I'm planing the face of this board. I'm gonna take a stab at it and look, I believe that the grain is going this way, but really, I won't be able to tell until I start planing. As soon as I plane, I can start feeling the grain. 
Now, when I play in this, it's kind of skipping along very subtly. You can hear it. I'm starting from one end and working all the way to the other side. Now, you can, you can hear it. We're making a continuous stroke all the way across the board. So I started over here and worked this way. Now I'm working back this way. This is just silky, silky smooth. I might go one more pass across the board, putting a fair amount of pressure as I start the cut right here on the front of the tote. Now the pressure is over the whole of the plane. A lot of pressure is down. As I exit the board, the pressure then is transferred to the back of the plane as I exit the board. What that does is it keeps me from ending up with a tapered board. That is just beautiful. This same exact technique works on hardwoods. I'm planing pine here, but I found when planing maple that it is helpful to have this type of plane. What makes a good plane or what makes a good tool is the sum of all of its parts. A plane, for example, has many, many parts, and the sum of all those parts working together is what makes a good tool. So buy the best you can afford and sharpen up your plane iron and enjoy.